So Z370C is here, as is the Intel 8700K. Now this is actually a pretty impressive bump up from what we've seen on the last, give or take, five years from this sort of platform. Now there is a few things I do want to clarify in this review, especially with regards to the socket and the chipset and compatibility areas, but first of all, let's take a look at the specs. So for this 8700K, you're looking at a 6 core 12 thread monster, you're also looking at a base clock of 3.7 gigahertz, only 100 megahertz higher than the Ryzen 7 1800X, just to point out, and with a single core boost clock of 4.7 gigahertz, considerably higher than Ryzen's about 4.1. You're also looking at a 95 watt TDP, 12 megs of total cache, and you're also looking at only 16 PCIe lanes available directly to the CPU itself from the motherboard. The extra uh, 24 lanes, because they do claim up to 40 in their press materials, it actually comes through the chipset, which is actually heavily, heavily bottlenecked by the DMI 3.0 X4 interface, which, um, as far as I'm aware anyway, is fairly equivalent to basically PCIe X4. So all of those extra 24 PCIe lanes, they're going through basically an X4 PCIe connection to the CPU, give or take anyway. So that's something to, to bear in mind if you're looking for extra expansion more than just two graphics cards. Just to expand on that a little bit, that means if you're using even just one of those M.2 SSD mounts, uh, as well as say a SATA hard drive and your rear LAN and your you know built-in audio, the audio, the LAN, the USB ports and the uh, SATA are all gonna be stealing bandwidth from that M.2 SSD. Also, if you're thinking about running M.2 SSD, you know, NVMe RAID, that's also going to be running at 2x configurate, you know, each SSD is going to be running at, using only two PCIe lanes, and that's not including what's going to be stolen from that by the SATA ports, the, you know, uh, rear audio, USB ports, and everything else that's connected through the chipset. Now, with that said, the actual CPU itself is listed for $359 at launch. That's likely going to translate into about £350 in the UK, as they seem to basically pick the same number and just change the sign at the front, which is a bit of a strange one, but nonetheless, that's what the sort of price you're looking at. When it comes to pricing for the motherboards, as I understand it, some companies are changing them slightly, and all of them are changing the prices to go up a little bit, but some of them are changing it by, you know, a couple of dollars kind of thing, where some of them are changing by tens of dollars for uh, the different models. Now, I want to make a, a little bit of another clarification, especially on the socket side of things. While this still is a socket 1151 LGA platform, you are actually looking at a different pinouts and a different actual sort of retention mechanism or retention pins such that you will not be able to use a 7700k or a 6700k or any of those sorts of chips in a Z370 board and likewise you will not be able to put a 8th generation Coffee Lake CPU into a Z270 or a Z170 motherboard. So with all the clarifications and the specs out of the way let's take a look at the performance. Starting off with Cinebench you can see that this performs pretty damn excellently in both single threaded and multi-threaded applications. Now when you're looking at the single threaded score you will notice that it is slower than the 7700K, uh, at least for the, the OC profile anyway, and that's just down to the boost and base clocks. When it comes to Asus Real Bench, it actually kind of blows a lot out of the water here, and thanks to it's just sheer uh, you know, clock speed improvement, even though it has two less cores than the 7820X, it actually is uh, basically on par with it, which is really very impressive, at least in this benchmark. When it comes to 3D Mark, again, you're actually seeing it slightly pip the post of the uh, 7820X, which is the 8 core variant. Uh, rather than the 6 core, and obviously the 6 core is well below that. When it comes to gaming results, it's pretty much as you'd expect. Realistically, you're not going to see a massive difference here. This is at 1080p, and I will be doing f uh, future videos with 1080 Ti's uh, testing between uh, the 1800X and the 8700K to give you a little bit of a better idea of all resolutions, but this is 1080p with a GTX 980. Again, in Dirt Rally, you're seeing a very similar result with 123 FPS, uh, which is, again is very similar to a lot of the other results that you'll see here and nothing really within you know margin of error that you won't notice. Now as you'll have seen I didn't include overclocker results here there's a couple of reasons for that one I don't have a suite of overclocked results for the other chips that are in my uh, graphs there so I don't want to give you sort of incomplete data there and also the chip itself uh, just runs ridiculously hot it still seems to suffer from the same issue as we'll likely see once people start delidding these but um, just at stock settings everything you know, like I, I manually set everything 
thing to auto in the BIOS. Um, I did have a, a strange bug where all cores were running at 4.7 GHz, which does mean that it seems to be fairly pushable, but uh, even still, I, I saw a max temperature of 94 degrees Celsius. Yeah, 94. I mean, that, that wasn't alone either. All of the, the, the package temperature was 90 degrees Celsius and the lowest temperature I observed just running Cinebench. This wasn't Prime 95, just Cinebench. The lowest temperature I saw there was, I think, in the area of 87 degrees Celsius. So this is not a cool chip on stock settings and you're really gonna have to push you know, some custom water cooling or something to get any sort of overclock out of it. So now we've got that out of the way, more of my thoughts here. Well, there's a couple of things I wanna hit on. First of all, on the motherboard front, because for all intents and purposes, these are the same motherboards that you'll see on a Z170 or a Z270 platform, just with that slightly reconfigured socket. Now sure, they might have better power phases or you know more robust power phases for that higher core count delivery. In fact, I measured or at least a uh, hardware monitor measured 140 watts of power usage from the chip under load. So that's fairly high, especially considering of this is a mainstream platform board. But nonetheless, from what I can see, there really isn't much of a difference, at least in terms of features anyway, compared to the Z270 boards. And it feels like they're just kind of locking you out with that different uh, pinout configuration. And I don't know if that was really necessary or if it was something that Intel are trying to do just to try and push forward the motherboard, uh, you know, board sales kind of thing or whether there was actually a necessity to do it. On the actual chip side themselves I'm really glad to see Intel coding a 6 core in the mainstream market. With that said the 7800X the 6 core that they launched about three months ago now that chip is basically obsolete now. I mean, sure, if you bought one, you're probably not gonna to be too disheartened because the 8700K is only a slight bit faster and realistically, you can overclock your chip to get the same sort of performance from it anyway. But, you know, for, from someone who's who's now looking at that market and is looking to buy a new PC or a new motherboard and processor, these sort of motherboards are considerably cheaper and yet, uh, you know, so is the actual chip itself. You get better performance out of the box from the mainstream platform rather than the high-end desktop platform, which is really a, a very confusing thing and I don't, I don't really understand that. I, perhaps that's part of the, the sort of rush to beat Ryzen. I just don't know. I am also fairly disappointed that Intel hasn't really seemed to learn its lesson from the last generation of chips where these are running ridiculously hot. Now, of course, this is still dissipating 140 watts of actual power here, which is kind of insane. And also, uh, I was using an air cooler for my testing and it wasn't a you know, massively beefy one. So that may come into, you know, that may be a factor, but you're still gonna need easily 240, if not 280 or even 360 millimeter water cooling range radiators available to you if you want to pick up one of these CPUs and especially if you want to overclock it. So with that said, what is my scoring? Well, for me, I think this is going to be a four for five for money. I think in terms of performance, it'll be a five. And in terms of functionality, because you're really not getting anything new besides the extra cores here, I'm going to go with a four. Styling, it's a CPU, so it'll be a five. And I think in terms of Tetium BB score, it's going to be a 4.5 and a gold award. It's certainly a fantastic chip. I think it plays very well into Intel's hands to compare itself to Ryzen, but when it comes to overall value for money standpoint, when it comes to the fact that you have to buy a brand new motherboard, even if you already bought a 7700K a couple of months ago, and also the fact that they've now made a chip that they've launched only like three months ago and basically obsolete, that's kind of crazy. Now, of course, if you do want to see any more about these Z370 motherboards, especially these two from ASUS, the video for uh, the video review for those two boards are coming out at the exact same time as this video. So feel free to take a look at those. I also recommend you take a look at the live stream that's coming out tonight, or will be live at 8 p.m. UK time tonight. We'll be talking about Gigabyte's uh, Z370 board as well. So do take a look at that. And otherwise, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful and informative. If you want to know any more about the boards or the chips, and you want to know the pricing when and where you watch this, take a look at the links in the description down below. If you want to support me making these videos on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and whenever the launches happen uh, basis, then feel free to take a look at the Amazon and Overclockers UK affiliate links in the description down below. They do genuinely help me out and support me making these videos. Otherwise, I've left some other videos over here for you. I will hopefully leave a link to, to these ones in the end card, so feel free to take a look at those. And otherwise, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next one. Oh, and I will be doing a video next week taking a look at the 1800X versus the 8700K to see which one is better.